Hi, let's talk about shaders. Hi, I'm Mike, and welcome to my channel where I like to talk about games and game design. And we're going to talk about shaders again today. Uh, specifically, we're going to make a water shader. Um, it's going to be a very basic water shader, uh, and we're going to be using it as an example to cover some of the basics of how to use textures, uh, how to understand UVs, and how to manipulate vertex positions within a shader. Uh, so if you come here hoping to find a more sophisticated version of a water shader, um, unfortunately this video isn't going to be for you. Uh, there's definitely some great resources online, but if you're here just because you want to learn more about shaders and how they function, or how to manipulate them to do what you want, uh, then stick around. Before we get to that though, we're going to go over the challenge that I left you last time. So at the end of the last video, I challenge you to make this cube. If you haven't already tried to reproduce it, I'd encourage you to give it a go. Maybe even just pause and think about how you would do it. I think it's good practice for trying to break down effects from other games. Let's take a look at what I did. Basically, all I did was I set the base color of the shader to red, and then I limited the position variable to only affect the green value of the albedo, and only along the y-axis. The actual practical applications of this particular effect are fairly limited, but slightly changing the color based on vertex positions can add depth to different effects. Now before we move over to making a basic water shader, I wanted to talk briefly about textures and UVs. Basically, UV coordinates are used when referencing textures because they're relative positions and are limited to a value between 0 and 1 as opposed to being absolute positions like X and Y usually are. This is useful for textures because you don't need to know what the resolution is of the image, and this lets you change the resolution on the fly without causing problems for your shader. One way you can think about them is as a percentage of the total distance traveled along the X or the Y axis. For example, if you wanted to reference the middle position of a texture uh, using the X and Y coordinate system, it would depend on how big the texture is. For example, for a 256 by 256 texture, the center value would be 128, 128. But for a larger texture, like a 2K texture, for example, it would be something like 1024, 1024. The UV coordinate system is useful in this case because it's the same in both the 256 and the 2K texture sizes. The UV coordinates for the center of the image are 0.5 and 0.5. So this is a visual demonstration of the UV coordinates of this quad mapped to the red and green values of the albedo. This is handled differently depending on the program you're using and the way things are set up. In this case, this is the default plane mesh as generated by Godot, and they've decided to have the UV coordinates start at 0, 0 at the top left corner, and 1, 1 is in the bottom right. So if we set up a shader like this for use on the cube, you can see it doesn't give us the image that we were just looking at. This is because the UV coordinates are for the entire texture, and on this particular cube, the UVs of each vertex are mapped to points inside of the texture. So if we keep the shader the same, and we just change the mesh from a cube to a plane, now we get the visual that we were looking at before. And so what happens if we want to animate the texture scrolling? Say, to simulate the motion of the surface of the water. One way to do that is to modify the UV values for each of the vertices, and that can end up looking something like this. Now in this example you can see the clear line moving across the quad, but if you had a seamlessly looping texture, you won't be able to see any lines like this. So in the interest of keeping things organized, I'm going to start a new scene to make the animated water texture. So new 3D scene, add a new mesh incidence, select plane, we'll add a shader material, and then go over to the folder, save, right click create a new resource, shader, save it as a GD shader. We'll specify that we're working on a spatial shader, uh, then we'll save and drag it to the material so we can see, see the changes as they're made. Since we'll be working with a texture, we know we'll need to be able to read it and access it in the shader. So we'll create a uniform variable. In Godot, it's called a sampler 2D. And then I know that we'll want to be able to adjust the speed of the wave, the displacement, so how far away from 
their default position they can go, and the frequency of the waves. So we'll have a new variable for each of those. Great. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to tap into the vertex shader. So one of the things that's important to know is that Godot has a lot of keywords that allow you to access some important features. Uh, and the one that's the most important for animating is time. We want things to change over time. So we luckily have the very simple keyword to remember, which is just all capital time. And it counts up the length of time the program has been running as a float value. So since we know we want to make these look like waves, we need to adjust the height value, make it go up and down over time. So if we add time to the vertex position, and if we limit it to just affecting the Y axis to go up, and now the plane has disappeared. So what happened? Time is always going to be increasing as the program runs. So if it's always going up, the plane will continue to go up into infinity or until we stop the program. So how do we fix that? Luckily, there's a math equation that is incredibly useful for this. Uh, and it's called the sine and the cosine function, which you may or may not remember from high school math. It's one of the more valuable equations that you want to remember exists because it's a repeating cycle that goes between negative one and one. So we'll add the sine function to the equation, which is simply just sine uh, time. And there we go. Still doesn't look very wave-like, but at least the plane is staying on screen. So how do we get the different vertices to be at different positions to simulate a wave? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the x position of the vertex and add that to the time position in the sine function. And there we go. We have the vertices moving or being at different positions at the same time. Still doesn't look like a wave, but that's because this plane only has four vertices. If you want it to look more like a wave, you're going to have to add more. In our case, in Godot, we can do that pretty easily because we use the generated plane mesh. So if we go back to the mesh, we click on the plane, we can now subdivide it. Uh, I'm going to go up to 10 in both the width and depth. And now we have something that actually kind of looks like a wave. It's a very large and not very interesting wave, but it's a wave. So here's where we can start using the amplitude, speed, and frequency variables that we set up before. We can add the variables to the equation with a sine wave, and where we put them is kind of important. So if you want to change the amplitude, you multiply the results of the function. If you want to increase the speed of the wave, you have to multiply the time factor inside of the function. And if you want to change the frequency of the wave, you have to multiply both the time and the vertex position inside of the sine function. And now we can play around with all of these different variables and you can see their effects. Now that we have waves traveling across this plane, let's incorporate the texture to add a little bit of noise variation to it. Let's use Godot to generate a new open simplex noise. We'll go to the texture in the material, click the drop down menu, select, select new noise, and then we'll create a new simplex noise. Now in the vertex shader, we will access the texture and use the RGB values to add to the height of the vertex position. Um, assuming that we're going to want to control how strong this influence is on the height, we'll add a new variable that we'll call strength, and we'll want to be able to control the speed at which this texture scrolls across the screen with another variable. So we can dial in how it looks in conjunction with the speed of the waves itself. So the first thing we're going to do is set up a variable to hold the results of the function that we will use to read the texture. Uh, in this case, it's going to be a vec4 because the results of the function are the color, so the R, G, and B values, and the alpha. And so to call the function, it's 
texture, we have to pass in a sampler 2D and a VEC2, in this case, noise texture. We can put in the default UV value for this vertex for now, but since we know we want to modify the UV to have it animate with time, we'll set up a new VEC2 and then have the UV be affected by time uh, and the noise speed. In this case, I'm going to change the noise speed from a float to a VEC2 so I can have independent control over the X and the Y directions or the U and the V directions of the scrolling motion. And now to have this texture affect the height of the vertex, we'll add it to the vertex.y. The last thing we want to do is we want to make sure we have the noise strength variable incorporated so we can control how much of an effect the noise texture has on the height. And there we go. You can see it's turned completely flat at the moment, and that's because we didn't give our variables any default values, so they've defaulted to zero. So if we go into the editor and make some changes, we can now see the effects. So now we have a plane moving up and down over time, looking somewhat like waves, but the color's not quite right. So I'm just going to do a simple fix here and change the color and do some mixing in the fragment shader. But another solution is to add another texture that looks like waves. Uh, or there's other shader tricks to make it look more or less realistic, depending on what you're going for. But for now, I just want to demonstrate some of the mixing techniques that you can use in the fragment shader. So in the fragment shader, we'll read the texture again so we can use those values to mix with a base blue color to give the illusion of depth. We'll also mix the color with the height of the waves in world space to further the illusion of depth in the water. So reading in the texture again, we'll set the noise to the albedo so we can see it. Grayscale isn't really wave-like, so let's add a base bluish green color and we'll mix it into the albedo by multiplying the noise. This basically mimics the multiply layer style in any other image editing program. Now here I'm playing around with a mix function, which will, it essentially interpolates between one color and another based on uh, the third float value. Quick tip, if you want to toggle a comment on or off, you can use Control or Command K. And there we go. We have a very basic water shader. Uh, hopefully you were able to follow along. If there's anything that was unclear or you're not sure of, um, leave a 
question in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer. Um, there's a lot more about shaders that we can talk about. Um, I do plan to continue to revisit shaders as a topic because I find them fascinating. Uh, if you have any particular shader effects that you'd like, um, like me to break down or talk about, I'll see what I can do. But for now, do all the YouTube stuff, like, share, comment, you know the drill. So until next time, go make cool stuff. See you later.